good afternoon ladies and gentlemen um unfortunately two of the speakers who were supposed to join us have not um, one of them has actually left and the other person we are trying to track down so we have uh, only two speakers and uh, we have a small audience so it's going to be a very uh, cozy session and uh, the speakers will have more time to present themselves um what we are going to do is to have them uh, speak and then have a question answer session right after that instead of at the end so may i request uh, you to invite the speakers as he said we have got two speakers for the session and the first speaker is mr sritha ayer from vodafone he's the head of vodafone business services kerala and we have our next speaker thanya patatil from cyber crimes please join us on the dais ma'am so like to welcome regina joseph to please join them on this we'll start off with mr sritha ayer so please okay uh, being the first speaker uh, is always little nervous the crowd makes me even more nervous so if we could just come a little closer it will be much easier for us to interact uh, what we have to present for you today is leveraging communication solution for business uh, as i just been introduced my name is shridhar ayer i head the b2b vertical what we call as what of business services for the kerala uh, team it's my 19th year as a professional uh, and my professional journey entails working with a lot of entrepreneurs through and through so i have been into key account management managing small enterprises and national corporates uh, for a long time and what we try to do is that we try to add value uh, to businesses it's about 9 years back that the telecom bug caught on to me till that time mobility meant mobile phone uh, a cliche product in my po pocket probably some amount of communication and at 16 rupee 40 paise i'll probably take a missed call than taking a call in okay so more like that and from there communication the way i have seen it evolving it's it's amazing and what amazes me more is the compelling environment around us uh, whether we talk about uh, the organizations that we work with uh, it's mostly our client who come and compel us uh, more so to kind of evolve to the next level of where we are so what i'm going to take you through is the evolution journey of this uh, entire uh, what we call telecommunication what it is doing to the industry i'll take you through some key trends that our customers are talking to us about today uh, and i'm sure in in a lot of uh, businesses that you guys operate uh, you'll also see some of these challenges coming in and probably will try and see uh, if they can be resolved they can be met if so how and what the concerns could be there in so with that i begin yes telecom is more like a musical journey this is what happened to uh, the music industry uh, of course everybody remembers the gramophone i think some of us still own it and then came a immediate era where music kind of transformed itself and today it is available to us as a couple of bytes in our pocket and you do not need a music instrument anymore but what it has done it has become accessible to probably every single person around the universe and the music has spread itself spreading itself music itself has evolved and if you ask me that's what has happened to telecommunication as well so to take you through what changes have been happening and this is a quick slide on what complexity of fragmentation with time the telecom has gone through like i said my initial era when i was using mobile phone is strictly you know one on one communication before that since i started before that i am a guy who was lucky enough to work in a pre mobile area as well Uh, so it was all face to face you had to go meet the customer uh, a trunk call used to call a bomb a isd call used to uh, really matter and you'll normally put a person to person i you know international call uh, to kind of save money and that was the world so tele telephone came in getting a telephone was about a 12 month journey to a 36 month journey depending on how lucky you were uh, till tatkals came in and then came another era and i think that changed because i was heading a business in fact i started my own venture at that point in time Uh, we were the principal consultants for global uh, uh, companies so how do you interact with them you are soliciting their products in india you talk to them on a 3 minute p2p call how do you connect there economically speaking i think faxes got us closer in okay if you call people people are not available in us and europe you at least leave a voicemail and that's how the journey began and then the mobile phone came in after it i think it's been an amazing decade that we have seen last uh, I was reading just yesterday when compared to even the most developed countries like US in a US typically a mobile is used for only two kind of applications and you'll be surprised it is voice and it is email beyond that whether it is gaming whether it is surfing 
whether it's knowledge, whether it's anything else, the dependency is still on a laptop or a desktop or as a device that we will know, but not mobile. Come to more developing nations and come down to India. Today, virtually anything and everything is done on mobile. And that is the era that we are in. But while this is happening, what is happening to the business space? What are the complexities? So to take you through this, these are five forces that are impacting us today. Okay. Uh, earlier, it was a mobile phone given to me by my company. Okay. And they believed that it was the best company, uh, the best mobile to have. They could have security around it. They controlled everything that I used around it. And it was strictly a business phone. But today, come on to today, to this, we are talking about consumerization. So there's a huge consumerization that's happening. People are choosing their own devices. People want to use it at their own will and space and time. And that is posing challenges to existing businesses. At the same time, when we look at people working in the organizations, you suddenly find that, in fact, in my office, though I have a separate office, there's nobody in the office virtually. We're working from the field. We're working from the train. We're working from the flight. You're working in the hotel. Right now, we're working in that uh, small corner that we've created for ourselves and our customers. So this is what you're doing. You're completely. And today, today everybody's demanding that flexible working. Third, if you look at organizations per se, a lot of new organizations, I was so happy listening to all the information that was being shared in the morning about the entire entrepreneurial stint that the Kerala is emerging through. But when an entrepreneur puts up his own business, he wants to ensure that he focuses on his core business and he doesn't try to learn everything around him. So when it comes to telecommunication or bringing communication solutions, it poses a challenge as to okay, what kind of a solution do I learn and then implement. So I, that's a, And people say, why should I waste my time on it? Let my time be spent more for my core business that I've entered into. And my, my, uh, we sit here, uh, okay, and uh, uh, I just speak to Regina and we suddenly see globalization happening uh, so uh, fast. She's not only bringing customers from US to India, she's also taking Indians to US and this is happening so fast. Every single organization that we are seeing today sitting in an incubation center, by the time it comes out, already has its products in four international markets. And that is what is happening. Globalization, how do we cater to that? And as you go forward, technology by itself, what is available today is redundant tomorrow. Okay? By the time you put implemented technology, is that technology future fit? Because it takes a lot of time to build a infrastructure, to build an ecosystem. Will it sustain for you tomorrow's growth? I think these are compelling things that would concern today's, our global enterprise, which are coming in from Kerala. So if I was to go into some of these trends in detail, okay? Like I told you, this is what we want to do, okay? We want to use our own devices and services for both work and play. Earlier, it was only work. Today, in fact, it has been statistically proven that people who are up to date on their social life, on your social media phone, are in fact more productive to organization as the earlier thought process would have deferred in organizations. The more you allow freedom to employees, they are also more willingly contributing to organizations. But there are challenges. You can't just let it free flow. First and foremost, where in any of the environment that you op operate in, you have IT policies which do not promote these kind of device usage. Okay, you are worried about the security of my data. You're so worried about the safety of the information that's carrying through the phone. Worst of all, think you lose your mobile is like losing a world. Yeah, that's what we live in today. Now, even if you're supposed to kind of get into managing such platforms, the cost of maintaining all these platforms in one go for a single organization is extremely expensive. They're not only limited and costly for end user support, okay? Employees also need to have multiple devices. So half the time, half thing they do on the mobile, then they're on the tablet, then they're on their uh, laptop and eventually a desktop back home, okay? And there is also a considerable amount of consumer indecision over consumerization and they are saying, okay, you can only use this and this is what we can afford. Flexibility and choice of business tools is what is today's enterprise requirement. This will lead to increased employee satisfaction and productivity. And you can always split usage uh, payment uh, for usage and hardware separately. This is what is the emerging trend that is coming in consumerism that is impacting us. The same thing when you want to go into workplace. Today people want to work when and where they want, okay, to bring in productivity. But there again, if you look at the present, I do not know how many of you work remotely. There are a lot of IT companies where you have work from home. Okay, there are a lot of Skyping happening, uh, a lot of other uh, technologies getting used. But remote working is frustrating because of fragmented communication. The platform is not the same. Okay, 
the uh, it isn't realistic anymore that is one of the reason why this is just not happening and believe me we still spend a lot of our capital uh, building uh, workspaces workstation for employees which could otherwise be put into business to channelize okay so this is what you want in today's telecom era the kind of telecom technology that we are uh, working on uh, with our clients you can work remotely with appropriate functionality which means agnostic to device you can control everything on the device still our employees can have a fair amount of work and play balance uh, how it is called today of course the way the technology is coming through if you see uh, earlier we used to only travel okay i used to go down to trivandrum to meet a client of mine spending 4 hours 5 hours on the road if lucky a train or so and so forth but look at it today today it's all happening over a hosted solution on video conferencing today i have a team here okay of about 100 people who work in different corners how do i connect with them it's a one single sms at a single point in time that makes a single message reach almost immediately but can you do that yes work groups can be created and there are platforms to control that as well today we talk about audio conferencing of course the feature is available on the phone but when you try to connect more than 5 users there's a user quality there's a disturbance what you can possibly do is that you don't even have to buy the service you just take a hosted service and on that you can add as many users and being the bench or you're the chairperson can control the entire dynamics including when to mute and when not to unmute these kind of facilities are today available which was not there it's reducing cost a lot and the kind of solution that you bring in since the hosted you don't maintain them there's nothing around it okay it is purely a you know plug and play kind of a system that we are getting into and one more uh, interesting thing is as cloud is coming in okay everybody is saying the cloud is coming in it's like waiting for the monsoon to happen uh, let me tell you ladies and gentlemen the cloud has ar arrived so let's we go together i'll tell you what the cloud is all about this is what i said businesses all business people want to stay focused on their core business they want to maximize revenue minimize cost so this is what is happening while they are trying to do that okay your current solution that they're using a complex expensive infrastructure it is distraction from core business they have to understand almost become a it technocrat to kind of understand the kind of technology that they're going to invest into uh, as we go further it's time consuming and the only time today's entrepreneur does not have is time okay you give him 5 minutes he wants to make a million dollars but if this is going to take a year to learn then i do not know where the time goes and like i said technology is changing at the drop of the hat what was available yesterday is today not viable okay at the same time for example let me just give you a very very simple example okay uh, we all are used to atms right atms in remote corners of the country would operate typically on a vsat vsat operates on a operating cost of about 25000 rupees a month okay what does it do transmit kilobits of data today you are able to do that securely on a sim card and the cost drops down to something like a thousand bucks this was not thought of earlier today when we look at remote pos machines lot of businesses expanding remote pos machines you don't have to invest in expensive expensive technology it's all available there but that is what you want to invest okay and what is happening okay so what a organize organization like us or a telecom company could do to you is it will reduce the complexity by externalizing the entire accountability of that entire uh, platform okay it is more opex than capex and at two emerging enterprises if you ask them what is the only thing they are most judicious about spending is capex and if you are going to put something to a technology it becomes redundant you rather go into plug and plug and play and use it as an opex so a lot of our solutions are opex driven than being capex driven okay we are talking about cloud technologies okay uh, what is cloud i was just sharing with my uh, friend today uh, somewhere saying that if your laptop does not have say a uh, cd rom Okay, CD-ROM is going off, but suddenly I give you a CD-ROM and you have to connect. I and you can connect over a Bluetooth cloud, over a Bluetooth cloud, and you can play the same device on your laptop while it is playing in mine. Okay, this hardware is not yours. I can lease it to you. It's plug and play. It's as simple as that. Today you can do the entire POS machines, entire logistics, everything on cloud inventing, and you don't have to go into data centers. You don't have to build your own infrastructure, and that is what is coming through. you get deeper insight in granular control because there are experts managing it you don't have to be an expert but they teach you everything that is required to learn uh, to manage that kind of a uh, system and of course 
these come as a predictable cost and there are no surprises in the entire package. And of course, we are speaking about globalization. So you got suppliers, multiple fragmented suppliers across, costs are unpredictable, complex service agreements with each one of them and hard to scale globally. And this is what the present global organizations are facing. What you can do? You can actually simplify the entire management. You can have a single global supplier. In fact, we have companies as small as a small IT company to whom we are not only managing their services in Cochin, we are also managing their services in New York as well. Okay, predictable and management cost. Communication to fit your, fit your footprint, which means that we bring the entire canvas and we only cut it as much as the footprint needs and you don't overinvest. And fully managed communications. And I think managed communications is going to be a big play area and uh, we are glad to say uh, as Vodafone, we are heavily investing into uh, this area. Currently, we have a few managed services products and we are launching few, few more, especially uh, the first one getting launched for logistics uh, coming in on a cloud-based managed services. And of course, the last of it, that mobile technology in itself. Let me tell you the journey that I started using mobile. The first thing the companies went about was hiring mob, uh, what they call as mobile doctors. The mobile doctor will walk into your house and tell you green button to pick a call, red button to disconnect. That is the evolution that I'm talking about. Today, from there, people are coming to me and saying, I want to run an X apps. Tell me how do I integrate it with my overall organization? That is evolution. So do you need mobile doctors even today? Yes, but an enhanced version of it. So this is what we want to do. We want to do a lot of uh, remote operations. Okay. We want to automate and centralize operation, which is data collection. Real-time business intelligence and analytics are available. And then welcome to disruptive technologies. Uh, this is like a very funny slide. But if you try to read through, the first one is a fork. It's an intelligent fork with a microchip. The microchip reads the speed at which you eat and the entire fork vibrates if you're eating too fast. Imagine that. Okay. Today, Bluetooth technology, where you're talking about Bluetooth exchange of, you know, data between two devices. Today, you have Bluetooth technology for virtually communicating between any two machines or even replacing a human being to, you know, communicate with uh, certain interfaces. That is what is happening. What do you see bottom? It's a biorhythm. Today we are talking about retina scan. Today we are talking about thumb impressions. Okay. This is what is happening. They say everybody has a unique biorhythm and biorhythm can be used for creating identities. That's amazing. This is what is happening in today's technology world. And this is where cloud provides you the evolution. I am so glad there are so many uh, startup villages which are providing incubation centers because when organizations start, uh, they don't have a lot of capital. But when organizations do start, also only thing that we are starved always about are capitals. So do we invest into technology? No. So this is what you do. Okay. There are a lot of English over there, but predominantly you are not owning the infrastructure. You are not putting your capex in. You are not maintaining this hardware. Uh, you are not doing anything around it. But all you are doing is you are plugging in, you are playing and you are paying as you go. And this is all cloud is all about. So. As I was speaking to you, this is my last slide. This is what is happening across. And let me tell you, we are very glad to be here uh, today, being a part of uh, this beautiful journey of Tycon, Kerala. Uh, when I heard Sir speak in the morning, uh, it was very, very powerful, telling me how many organizations are coming through. Uh, the way uh, the, the, the current government initiatives, what Tycon is trying to do, what the entrepreneurs of Kerala are trying to do, I think is to build a ecosystem that is good for uh, entrepreneurs to grow. What we would like to do is to bring these realities of today's management in front of you, design and customize solutions uh, which are specifically made for you and we can probably tailor make for any single organization or a type of industry that we do today. So thank you for having me here. I think I have had my time. I'll just end it with an AV and I'll just need two minutes for that. Because I can't tell you everything. I think this AV is powerful enough. Can I get audio please? It's a global brand with roots spread far and wide. We have millions of happy customers across the globe and are rated as one of the top 10 most valuable brands in the world. 
We started our journey in India with just one circle in 1995. Today, not only do we cover the whole country, but are also one of the most admired brands in India. We are also recognized as the most trusted service brand in telecom on the back of our products and services. Our communication solutions combine our global experience with local knowledge so that businesses in India can benefit from our association and move towards an easier path to growth. At Vodafone, we understand your business needs and provide a suite of telecommunication solutions that help to enhance the efficiency and productivity of your organization. We believe that businesses today look for communication solutions which help them to be efficient and also optimize costs. Our voice and data solutions delivered over our mobility and wireline network ensure that your business is connected at all times. We hope with our suite of solutions, we will be able to service business needs better. What enables us to offer you these services is our robust network infrastructure spread across the country, which is supported by our ISO certified network operating center. It helps us monitor and track this network efficiently. Above all, it's our service that helps set us apart. Our greatest strength is our people. Our dedicated service teams have strived to nurture our relationships with our customers. And we are always happy to help. Please feel free to call your account manager for any help you may need. Thank you. Thank you ladies and gentlemen for this time. And there is a placard kept on every table. It has got an email ID. Uh, we are completely available today and tomorrow. Uh, and if still if you want to write into us there's an email id that you can write into us for thank you so much the topic is open for discussion any questions then everybody has questions <laughs> thank right. you sridhar thank you um our next speaker is uh, ms dhanya patatil may i ask uh, you need to introduce her yeah with pleasure sir dhanya welcome Tanya has worked as a consultant on various projects related to e-commerce and other related sectors in cyber world. Her credentials, apart from being an engineer and MBA, includes EMBA HR from the National Institute of Business Management, Chennai. She acquired the post of a cyber crime investigator after completing her certified course from Asian School of Cyber Law, Pune. She's also the advisory board member for the Cyber Crime Fighters Association International. Welcome. Thank you. Please take over. Thank you very much for the taken aback uh, by seeing this card of mine because I was used to being called as expert in cyber crimes since the day I got into this. But just want to correct everybody: I'm not an expert in cyber crimes. I'm a cyber crime investigator. I only talk about cyber crimes, uh, and I don't know how much of uh, my discussions or my point of view would be actually on the positive note because from where, where uh, mr sridhar ayer spoke i would be pulling all of you all back <laughs> because he talks about progressing technology and uh, the benefits of the technology which i too heard once upon a time when i was a student and which brought me into the uh, world of cyberspace but today unfortunately everywhere i go i only talk about the negatives of this technology uh, <coughs> There are two aspects which I deal uh, whenever I come across certain cases. Being an investigator and a consultant to uh, various organizations on their IT security, there are two different aspects. One is the social aspect and the other is the organizational aspect. The organizational aspect, of course, I'm very glad talking about and very happy because uh, it means business just like it is for you, for me also it means business. But uh, the social aspect is very demoralizing and very frustrating because of which we had to open a, a trust along with our company too. Mm. Would, do you want me to talk about certain issues that have, that have gone through in the organization? So just generally speak about cyber crimes. Issues, okay. The first issue that I did deal with as a trainer in this field, I mean, sorry, the trainee in the field was uh, banking fraud, which is called the salami attack, which is on the uh, internet also. It's called the Zeitler's case. If you actually look at it, it was just a small patch which was uh, put into the banking software. And uh, 
it interrupted with the day end process of the bank it so happened that an employee just uh, was given notice to leave and during the tw 20 days of notice period he edited the software of the com of the bank so that whenever the day, day end of the bank happened the bank had a arrangement to uh, sort out its account uh, accounts in the alphabetical order so he opened an account called zaitless with z and y coming together and he said every amount which is less than 50 pais would drop down to the last account of the bank which means every amount in any account which went minus 50 pies would go into this last account. The bank wouldn't notice the change because the day end always tallied. The balances came from different accounts and dropped into one another account. There was no account to account check in the bank as a normal procedure. Now what happened is this went on for six months and four days. On the fourth day what happened is that there, a person came in and opened an account called Zakir. Normal course it shouldn't disrupt with the uh, patch software whatever has made but because of numerological issues, his name was double Z. So the very, after a week after he opened his account and he came up to the bank and uh, asked the officer to update his passbook, the officer said, you're having a very huge balance, sir. Are you doing some kind of a royalty writing or something because of which you're getting small transfers into your account? He asked the balance and the balance was six crores and above. So he said, I have not done anything in my life to get so much balance. And that is how the case altogether started off. It took actually six members to work day and night for four continuous days to find out where this patch was. And the patch was only 10 line big. So that is the negativity of the technology with which I started off my career as a cybercrime investigator in organizations. And from there on, I have gone or addressed issues where people have simply uh, you know, uh, should I call it a theft of data by uh, having an auto forward installed in the mail server of the organization or carelessly giving out the hard disk for a third party repair and maintenance. So cases have been umpteen and uh, the cases have not been, uh, are not limited to the other parts of India or the big business houses in India. Most of my cases that I deal and I've been dealing after 2008 are from Kerala and I am settled in Thrissur with an office in Thrissur and doing quite well so I think I answer all the, <laughs> all the questions in one shot <laughs> because whenever I go to speak uh, I ask them for about one hour one and a half hours and I was told 15 minutes I didn't know how to bring everything together so I just put all these few words together so that and I think I'm open for questions now uh, examples I can go on sir but then Okay, I am um, an organization. The MD of an organization calls me up saying, uh, Our competitors brought out our a product which is very much similar to mine, which I had planned for a festival season. So, the, I doubt there is a person insider who is giving out this information. We go about investigating the data and the uh, uh, emails and the uh, data transfer procedures, etc. Finally, only to know that one person who was the who was in the core committee of the 12 member committee decisive body of the company he didn't know how to use the laptop he was not very tech savvy but he had all the data in his office, in his laptop he carried his laptop home and he came back also one day his laptop was not working so inadvertently he called up a boy from a neighborhood said please do something he did something which he didn't know how to answer what he did but his laptop started working now the boy had some data which he didn't know how to decipher. He used the same hard disk to repair some other laptop of, some, of another officer who was working in a competitive company. He didn't know these were competitors. Everything happened so inadvertently that the competitive company had the entire process, the pri price chart, the supplier list, the costing, the production methodology, everything with him. That all he had to do is he had near approximately 20 days less for the festive season to begin and he had the product out in the market where the other company was researching and devising it for the last nine months. That's one example. Yes. What are the precautions that are to be made, uh, that, is to, that are to be there in place and what are the re re remedies that are, are available after these problems happen? Okay. And, what will ha uh, and uh, how are the customers of yours 
benefited by you like how do they help how do you help them uh, the qu first question is what are the precautions to be taken the one and the only answer is make everybody aware of the technology now all of us are so drowned in this technology that we are used to using this technology so carelessly we don't think about the other side it is not that none of us don't know how to use it we just don't think about the, the other side of the technology so probably make every every person aware of the possibilities and probabilities in this technology and that is the only end to end solution to this well i can and what i do to the to my clients is that i give them advice on the legal pre precautions to be taken on the standardization procedures to be followed and the technical uh, options available for the security but if even if my client is sitting over here what i have to only tell them is that you can now if, even if you ask me what which is the costliest and the 100% secure technology or the software that you can offer for data security in my office i would say no technology offers you 100% security it is only 80% it is just like how we buy a lock to our house there is no lock that you can assure a thief will not break into so technical security is just 80% the rest of the 20% is covered by legal remedies standardizations and awareness this 20% is as much important as the rest of the 80% that we can ever cater to so uh, these are the remedies that we follow that we have we uh, that is how we i help my or my organization helps my client by actually uh, devising the legal systems, the standardization procedures, the audit systems, and recommending certain products to them so that they can do the, come to this 80% mark. We also train the employees so that the rest of the 20% is also covered. Now, the next part of the question that uh, he asked was the uh, what are the remedies that can be offered once an uh, accident happens? I call them accidents because they're always, most of the time, inadvertent. So once the accident has happened, if you do not have a standardization policy, unfortunately, there is no remedy today. I'm employed these days by organizations which do not have a standardization policies, only to tell them who was smart and where did the organization f fail in protecting their system. There is no legal remedy as on today after the amendment in 2008. But if you have a standardization procedure, definitely the legal recourse is much larger than any of the other uh, acts or legal sections can give you because IT Act says the civil penalty is not restricted. There is no limitation of civ civil uh, penalties on IT platform. If the claim is less than five crores, it can be handled by the adjudicating officer of the state. If it is above five crores, any anybody can go to the civil court and follow the normal civil pr procedures. Sorry. Now the adju adjudicating officer is the state IT secretary and it is there in every state except in Kerala now we go to Tamil Nadu right now the standardization part the law says it can be either ISMS which is ISO 27001 or it can be any kind of procedure which every organization can devise by themselves and get it certified by CERT in. CERT in is the apex body on uh, information technology in India. Just like the Reserve Bank for the banking info infrastructure, we have CERT in for the information technology infrastructure. But till date, my experience says no organization has got their uh, certification done from CERT in till date. All these organizations who have got some kind of a standardization have always got through the ISMS procedure, which is ISO 27001. This is the legal. The, the, law, say, the law says you have to follow the standardization. There's no other okay. course. Both yes, both are linked. And, uh, it's read under Section 43 of uh, IT Act, IT 2001, 2000, amended in 2008. Any more questions? No, honestly, no. I have not. Uh, uh, though I have had case studies from my Apex organization, which is called Asian School of Cyber Laws, I have had certain case studies on uh, cloud computing, but I've not had any real time cases now here yet on cloud. So, uh, well, to be very honest, like every other professional, I also got into this profession about nine years back, and I study whenever I'm asked to study. So I've not done much of a research on cloud computing, I'm sorry. Uh, 
see standardization is basically having certain procedures and rules and regulations laid out in within your organization now uh, when these standards meet the general standards applied or in, uh, insisted by ISMS or ISO 27001 there are 133 points listed on the uh, for ISM, ISO 27001 so you have to match your organization requirements with this 133 points and once it is done and the internal auditing is done on a specific period there is a uh, certifying authority which comes in. They do an external audit on your organization and certify you. And every certificate is valid for three years, provided the law says you have to get yourself audited every minimum annually once. The law insists that the audit has to be once in a year. It can be more, but minimum one, once in a year. Yes, both on the social and on the organizational levels. On the social level, we do have a lot of awareness programs running uh, across the schools, from, right from the schools in the state or even outside the state. And I guess there are no more questions, sir. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danya. Our third speaker is, uh, is Regina Joseph. Uh, may I request her to yeah, introduce Yeah, sure. Regina Joseph, she's a charter member of Time, Houston. Reggie Joseph is a serial entrepreneur and president of R2 Point LLC, a Texas-based company that consults with a wide range of business on strategy, market development, and technology areas. She's also the vice president of a Houston-based construction and building management company, focusing on healthcare and industrial facilities. She's serving on the advisory board of eFactor INC, the largest entrepreneurial community in the world. Ms. Joseph has been actively involved in several non-profit organizations with its fundraising and public relations effort and actively involved in various community activities in the U.S. Ma'am, you're most welcome to Taikan Kerala 2013. If I could request you to please take over. Thank you. Um, I guess we are all in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, entrepreneur thing, and I just love that field. I'm just coming from a IBM side, IBM and Pricewaterhouse side, and I left about three three years ago and uh, started working on the entrepreneurial system. Um, this is just a, I just, a, um, I know Thai is in the entrepreneurial system. There is so many companies that we can think of. All of them are working on towards for the, to develop and enhance the entrepreneurial thing. They are like, each of them are on the networking side, some are on the knowledge side, some are on the funding side, and some are on the saving cost. And if you look at it, there is, I don't know, I just came back from Bangalore two days ago. They had a Google and a Microsoft Ventures, and they were awarding the one of the most promising entrepreneurs for 10 lakhs. I was one of the judges, and I couldn't just believe it, the number of um, what they call entrepreneur programs in the country. Um, so we have several of this one, I don't know. Um, some of the emerging trends we have is, uh, what I really like about the women entrepreneurship, and one thing I found it from going around the different entrepreneur programs is the mentoring. I think people spend so much time on developing the product and then they just uh, um, not enough having a mentoring and they just get so focused on the product system and then they said, oh, we need a, some kind of advisor just to help us to throw it, especially the young entrepreneurs. With then the other one is that I was following is crowdfunding landscape, and I really love crowdfunding, and I don't know how much is this over here, but I can tell you a story about crowdfunding. I think before Facebook started, um, became public and everything two, three years ago, uh, one of the Facebook employees were selling some shares from Austin. Um, I got a call from someone saying, hey, he wants the $1 million. Um, can you come up with a million dollar and we can buy the, the shares? And this a request came in, in, um, in one Wednesday afternoon. And I just said, uh, how in the world are we gonna get it $1 million by Monday? You know, that's like a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Sunday banks are not open. So I called a friend in Seattle and 14 of us got together and we called two people in Bangalore, three people in Delhi, two people in Seattle, and just the money, and we had a minimum of 50 grand. We had no people in between or anything. I think by like a Friday evening or Saturday, we started a company called the Terra Chera. You know, it's just like your face. And uh, money just coming in. Um, by Monday morning, we had a one million. We had to stop it. We're not taking any more thing. We didn't have any people to take the fund fees or anything like that. It's just a group from group of friends got together and uh, made it possible because everyone believed in Facebook. By Monday morning, I was the president <laughs> of this new company. 
and uh, we got over 1.2 million dollars by monday morning and uh, we bought out the shares from facebook from these employees and uh, went through the share post and they got it all of us got into um, facebook as shareholders um so from there i just started loving this crowdfunding and i don't know how much that's in uh, here in um, india i guess uh, i heard a query model is not permitted in india but um it's going very well and um, right now me and my friends are we are on the like a fourth or fifth side of the crowdfunding just to getting the group together and buying out thing we don't have anyone coming in between or anything like that um these are the some of the crowdfunding people in um in uh, india so with all this going on um i decided uh, that i wanted to work with uh, some online entrepreneurial community um in the world that can put all of us together so i found this company called e factor e factor is a, the largest online community i don't know how much how many of you people are um members of um e factor just like a facebook for the all common people and linkedin for professional e e factor is the uh online community for the um entrepreneurs so they have a different thing they have a networking they have funding it's a free and the saving um they have a mentorship and everything they have vip membership and everything they buying companies left and right and they just went in public about um few is again we just got all of us got together jumped into the wagon of e factor um so you can go to efactor.com and find all the details about it. and i became the advisor for the asia and uh, we setting up offices here in india um we just uh, hired a country lead uh, he is a former airtel chief from delhi he is going to lead the uh, e factor there and we right now did in bombay bombay is the uh, main uh, operation committee and we starting one in bangalore and one in kochi we having um um so my job is to find the people in each of these regional leads and set it up and leave that's my job for the e factor so once i done with india then we moving to the rest of the asia so this is very big uh, our presence in europe in india we have a 75000 members us 700 netherlands 40000 uk 25000 china and others so it's over like a 1.2 million people are right now in this group it's a median age and it's very interestingly it's 25 to 45 years a lot of technology these are the main ones uh, the founders are netherlands two uh, partners one uh, adri and marian they they are serial entrepreneurs they got together developed it to this uh, program there's lot of companies are jumping into the e factor as a um like a co-sponsors and everything um so if you you know if you guys if you, any of your own businesses like the new entrepreneur and thing get into e factor connect with me or connect with the people they do crowdfunding and uh, um they do crowdfunding they do the mentoring they do the um you know networking and they can connect with the anywhere from anywhere people in that on the world um really like the program and um so uh, my company r2 point what i do is uh, basically bringing us companies to india and uh, vice versa so we taking uh, um one of your competitor not vodafone i cannot tell you we taking one of the telecom industry to us at this point um so e factor is coming to india um so there's three companies going to back to us um we are also doing the healthcare side we have a, a company one pointing away specializing in um building hospitals and physician building thing and we are also kind of merging with apollo here so if you guys uh, are interested in anything with the e factor just let me know on the young entrepreneurs connecting on crowdfunding or mentoring anything they are looking for people in we haven't started in kerala yet but uh, i think uh, talking to george chan and everything he was saying that cochin is the best place we were considering trivandrum and cochin and they said trivandrum cochin is the best place any questions anything about it i know it's a general topic but yeah anyway can thank ask, you. can i ask a question sure when you say you have this um, you know people all over the world and uh, you know are they going to buy into companies and you know who's accountable what i mean what happens it's uh, it's just like a, how do you get into facebook it's a free thing so you go and log on to e factor you put your profile and everything you just tell them your interest and everything and you saying i wanted this many people from bombay region it goes by regional it's just connecting different businesses like you want to promote your company and if you're very good with it you write a note to them 
you know, I want to be the partner of E-Factor. There are several partners you said. Right now, they just uh, bought out to this one company from Dubai, Elect. They do the event management, but it's only for the high profile people, people like uh, sheiks and everything. So they're like a Maserati comes to your house to pick up your guests and hold these big parties. So, you know, you might think this is social parties, but social parties where they have started talking about funding and everything, you know, because they are the one millionaires have the money. And uh, so you like to coming into a play with the e-factor. Um, so it is like, it's kind of you think of a platform for all the people to connect and everything. And we don't have the online collaboration community right now. Thai is just a one group, you know, that you all think. Maybe we can have a Thai Kerala in efactor.com. Thai Cochin, I mean, Thai Mumbai one part of thing, because you can group together, because we don't have a, a community, online community in the thing. But what's the revenue stream of uh, eFactor? The revenue stream comes the eFactor is, uh, it's, uh, if you're a VIP member, you got to pay $350 a year. And that's like an unlimited webinar. Like, a, for example, Kevin Harrington, that's a shark of the tank uh, coming from um, uh, New York. And then have a Tom Trainer, he's a CIO of PepsiCo. So they have this very influential speakers who is coming they do the webinar. So unlimited webinars, and you're supposed to have six live events in each city. So that is one of them. And uh, like a constant contact, the marketing material, any of the sponsor, like if you, Vodafone becomes the, the preferred telecom provider of eFactor and all its one million members, you will have to put a certain percentage back to the, the, the company. Yeah, it's mainly for the revenues and everything, but it's just like people don't have a time to come for it. Like we're starting one in uh, uh, eFactor in college campuses. University of Texas, Austin has the very good one. So just like NYU, Boston and everything, they have an entrepreneurial group. So now they're gonna have an eFactor club in every, most of the universities and providing entrepreneurial support for all these kids. So that's how they bring in, it's just mainly by the members of the people coming in. Anyone else? Yeah, I have some projects and programs going on. So how can I get to you then? Just log on to eFactor. Well, say that again, I didn't hear you. you see, I have some projects and programs going on moving around. So how can I get to you for help? I have to log on to eFactor. Are you looking for funding or are you looking for networking? Um, in many ways, maybe advices and funding. And to, uh, so you just log on to eFactor.com. First, you go to eFactorGroup.com and understand the company. eFactorGroup.com will tell you all the founders, all the main sponsors and main companies. There's tons of companies who became partners of it. Then go to eFactor.com and uh, become a member. And you just click on it. You wanted an India region or you want to put your skill. You know, what do you want? Which project? You are in the construction industry or you are in the IT security. Then connect with all the people. It's just purely online. What we have done is so far is uh, crowdfunding is eFactor, what eFactor does is like if you have a, if you need a funds, right, you kind of, they have a, this mini business plan template that you send it to the group. There's a group of people around the world that they have chosen one from Amsterdam and everything. And it goes to a group of investors, the application. And if people are interested in that one, you know, you get the funds from you, whatever you wanted. It goes like if say you are an ABC company, and ABC needs like a half a million dollar and you send the request to business plan to this thing and different people who are interested in will join that group of people. That's through e-factor. But the, what I, I've done is for like my company is just like if we group of us, I really believe in this word of mouth thing. I don't, I mean, I, although I'm an advisor to the e-factor and everything, um, like it, you just need to find out who's the influential people in the city, right? In Houston, I pretty much know who got the deep pockets. I mean, I can just go around and just tell them, oh, this Asha. And I look at it, all these high net worth, you know, we call it HNV, high net worth value people who are above like a 10 million and above who started businesses like that. They got plenty of money and they're just constantly looking for where to invest money. So pretty much they are in most of the thing. Like for example, a guy named Asha. He just always says, Reggie, if you have something, idea come up, just let me know. And we just get together and everything. Oh, just we got this company. It's promising. And we look at their stuff and we start funding them. It's just as simple as that. It's not like an angel investor or uh, any of those. You know, it's just simple as that, like I did with the Facebook. 
it was like a four days raise the one million and everyone is happy facebook value went up what we did is after six months everyone got their shares through the brokerage company like my brokerage company took my shares and then we dismantled the we called the accountant and uh, closed the company we start the llc just to make sure the in investors are all comfortable right no one is taking it so we got a hire a lawyer hired an accountant and he's like this and i just said mr watson we got a you know million dollar coming in can you just take care of it and he just exactly say okay reggie joseph got a 200000 shankar got a 30000 you know he manages everything it's just as simple as that and i really like that, that process and ever since that two or three became quite successful in um, in houston um, it's kind of spreading around right now it's just within few people i mean trusted people that thing then people are investing in real estate technology um, you know people are talking about security the biggest security we, we were worried about in houston and across the us is home security and i think we're putting money left and right on the home security systems as well and uh, even for the bangalore uh, one of the top presentation was I was telling in some of the uh, audience that the home home security one of the mobile application got the first one i mean i thought it was just the us but here also it's the same thing it's the innovative ideas it's just mobile applications because with the recession in the us and everything people are worried about it and we live in a community where they have a you know high profile people and the 10 o'clock at night lawn mowers coming and getting into the house and stealing everything and it, especially they're attacking indians and pakistanis so there is a there's a big demand for the home security we like an average home security in our um, area is about two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a million dollar million dollar house people invested close to two hundred thousand dollars just for the home security right now it's just that demand and they don't care about how much money they have to spend for the home security so that's like one of the big um, things and the real estate of course healthcare like in the city where I'm coming from it's oil and gas and the hospitals healthcare because Houston is the like number one city for the hospitals and we have all the oil and gas companies in the town like Chevron, Texas, Wells and everything so there is a lot of oil and gas um, mobile applications and uh, people wanted to invest money coming in constantly in the town we uh, on the crowdfunding we have to sign a paper for the SEC that you are eligible for the to invest it like uh, we don't ask people um, like if it's over 1 million you need to have a total assets about uh, over 500,000 you are um, it's just a simple sample paper um, that's how we go through the lawyer and he asked these questions um, you know are you okay to invest this much money in the company you understand the risk involved in that one and uh, you know I, I mean, in, in foreign countries it is poss quite possible because a lot of uh, people are you know uh, uh, rich enough to uh, uh, give, handle money like that but in, not in India, I mean in Kerala or in, in Kochi, you, are, you said you are starting up an office in Kochi. So like how much we can expect that in Kochi, you are, you know, your business, uh, the concept of crowdfunding will be helping you to uh, I mean, uh, back up the... Uh, I think we're changing everything, all the rates and everything we're changing in for India. The whole online, we're not asking 347 for the Indian community. Um, we're probably going to go much less amount on the crowdfunding for the India. We haven't gone that that far. We are approaching an IT company to change that the whole thing for India. Right now, it's just a word of mouth, and uh, it's online. It's not really coaching so thing. Even if you go to efactor.com and you just apply for a, one of the you want a crowdfunding, it's not coming from money from coaching. It could be somebody who is interested from China could be saying, oh, you know, hey, I'm interested in your company. I would like to put ten thousand dollars for it. But I wanted this, you know, I wanted like a certain percentage in return or I want a certain percent in the query. How, how is this person from China? Like, uh, how are you accountable to this uh, person from China? Like, how um, is there any kind of security? Like, if a person from China is... E factor, e, yeah, E factor. 
what 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 is this? E Factor has a, a group of people who checks through these applications that's real and everything. They do the investigative background checking and everything. And when the investors pull together, E Factor has just become like a mediator. So they do all the uh, background check of the investors. They do all the background and, and they come in between as a mediator. So no fake accounts are being what is it? No fake No fake out account. Being they, you know, no. They, it comes and checks on the stuff. You know, they look at the website and things like that. But, I mean, you can create an e-factored uh, one account over there, but when it comes to the investor and everything, they would make a phone call and they would ask you a tax return and things like that. It's so right now 1.2 million. We are expecting much more than that. In the in the India is not part of India and China didn't come into the factory yet. India only 55,000. Now we brought this Airtel lead to uh, India. So he's going to bring uh, quite a few people. And already there is a big telecom uh, conferences in Bahrain and e factory is one of the things. So they planning to get Bahrain and Saudi Arabia audience into the group too, in the telecom industry. Thank you all. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, Sridhar first, who explained to us the wonders of uh, you know cellular and modern technology. Um, Dania for showing us how to be cautious and the things that can go wrong. And all those who want to get to know the deep-pocketed people, please contact Regina. All right. Please accept a um, small memento from the organizers of Thai for being here. I'd like to welcome Mr. John Chaco, who chaired the session for us, to please hand over the token of appreciation. On behalf of Thai Kerala, to the speakers, we have Mr. Sridhar Ayer receiving the memento first. A big hand, please, people. To Ms. Dhania Patatil, and finally, Ms. Regina Joseph. Thank you so much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.